Hi Priyasha. Hi, hi everybody. Welcome to today's session. Yeah, hi, hi. Uh, this is Ramanuj from Law Seco, and let's all welcome Priyasha, uh, today's uh, speaker. And uh, uh, Priyasha has been somebody who I I worked in trial legal very briefly with Priyasha, and after that she has been uh, she 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 was a senior associate at trial legal, and then she moved to Dubai to work in a law firm in Dubai. And after that, now she's doing something of her own. Currently, I believe Priyasha will tell us more about that. Uh, Priyasha, why don't you uh, begin by telling about your career journey so far, what you have been doing, uh, you know, um, starting from where you are, that will be great. Like a, a background will give people a context to your journey and how uh, you can help us. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, well, first of all, hello everyone. Um, and I hope you're all staying safe and sane wherever you are. Um, just wanted to make sure, can you hear me? I mean, if you can just... Yeah, yeah, you're clearly. But if, if people, you guys can hear Priyasha, just type yes on the chat. Yeah, you can hear. No problem. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, um, and, and I request everybody to introduce yourselves, just write in the chat box who you are and what you do and what you're looking to take away from today's session so that we can keep in mind what value you want. Okay, great. Priyasha, Priyasha why don't you start? Yeah. Okay, so, um, well, again, like I said, I hope all of you are safe, uh, staying safe and sane wherever you are. I have definitely had to work on preserving my sanity during this time, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I think we all have our challenges to face. Now, um, yeah, so I'm actually very excited to talk about this topic because it's, it's something that's uh, very close to my heart. And I receive a lot of messages from people, uh, you know, asking questions on this topic, specifically on LinkedIn. And sometimes I'm not really able to reach out to everybody. And, 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 that's, why, uh, and that's why I'm so excited about speaking uh, to speak on this today and especially and I'd like to thank Ramanuj and Law Seeker for this platform to reach out to so many of you. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to introduce myself but maybe I would I would share my screen because that's where sure, sure. I have yeah. uh, you know a presentation and that's where I'm talking a little bit about myself as well so so I think that would be a good introduction to start with. It's so great to see so many of you here today so I'm sure it's going to be a very interactive session. Um, in fact, um, I will be going through with a presentation and we will have a very interactive Q&A session at the end. And so I'm quite excited about that. Okay, I've given you permission to share. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to start with, okay. Great. So I think you, I mean, well, we all know why we're all here to discuss how to enter the UAE legal market. Um, so now, yeah, I mean, before I dive into the presentation, I will indulge in a little bit of shameless self-promotion. But uh, having said that, you know, there's a lot that you can probably find out about me on LinkedIn. So I do invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn and to follow me as well. But what I will say today is that um, I'm actually quite excited about the idea of helping lawyers move to different jurisdictions and practice in foreign countries. Um, I also strongly believe that the legal profession should be more accessible and international. I take the example of techies, you know, they can move to so many different countries and they don't really have any issues because their skills are transferable. Uh, similarly, I do strongly believe that legal skills are transferable as well. And uh, in due course, um, I do think that the legal industry should be disrupted and, and lawyers should have the opportunity to practice all over the world. And we might actually even see that coming soon, you know, especially with people getting more, um, you know, people getting more open to the idea of online courts and all of that. So hopefully we, we see that disruption soon. Um, on that note, I would also like to uh, say that I'm, I'm the founder of QLTS Geek. Uh, it's, a, it's essentially a mobile app which is aimed at foreign lawyers uh, qualifying as a solicitor in the UK. So we're essentially right now in the process of rebuilding the app and adding more features. So it's going to be upgraded soon and so watch the space for updates. And like I said, 
I invite you to follow me on LinkedIn and, and, and that's when you would get to know a lot more updates from me. So yeah, I'm, I'm not going to talk about enough about me for now. I'm going to dive in straight into what we're going to talk about today. So what will I cover today? So today I'm going to first talk about a little bit about the UAE. So I'll give you, I will focus on the legal system because that is where you can figure out where to find a niche for yourself in the market. So once you understand the legal system, you would also have a better understanding of how to enter the market. Second, um, I will talk about the UAE legal market as well. Now, I don't want to paint a rosy picture, but it is a little challenging to enter the legal market. Um, having said that, um, you know, I actually like it when it, something is difficult because it actually is good news because when something is difficult, it, it means that it is possible. You know, if somebody were to say that it's impossible, then that's quite a pain. But if something is difficult, it means that it is possible. It's just that you are going to face a few hurdles in the way. So it helps to, you know, enter the market with this mindset, knowing that, yes, things are going to be slightly challenging. But, but yes, I mean, with persistence, you will find a way. Um, third is, I will talk about my experience of how I was looking for a job in the UAE. So based on my experience, um, you will definitely learn from the mistakes that I made and I can tell you what worked for me. So these are the, some of the tips that I can share. And fourth, I'm also going to be talking about networking because that's very important in the UAE if you're looking for a job. As well as once you're in the market, networking is quite important and um, that's going to really, um, you know, make or break the deal sometimes. And finally, um, the best part of today's presentation will be the Q&A because that's where we get to interact with each other and, you know, I, I can, I can uh, address some of your questions and, and, I, think, and I think that's really, uh, you know, the best part of today. But having said that, I think um, I will be covering a lot in my presentation today and some of it might go over your head. But what I would say is that let's leave all the questions to the end because what might happen is that I could answer, I might just end up answering some of your questions as I go through with the presentation. Okay, so, so a little bit about the UAE before we jump into the details. You know, the funny thing is before I entered the Middle East, I didn't really know much about, you know, um, the region. And I had so many wrong misconceptions. For example, you know, I thought Dubai was a country. Uh, the funny thing is, I also thought that, you know, I was apprehensive about booking flights on Emirates or Etihad Airways because I thought, okay, maybe they're not safe to travel in. So uh, there were a lot, many embarrassing misconceptions that I had. Um, and so that's why I think sometimes it's helpful to just learn a little bit about the country before, you know, you apply for opportunities. Um, so just a very quick overview, uh, the UAE, United Arab Emirates, essentially is comprised of seven emirates, which is seven states. So there's uh, Dubai. Dubai is the most popular and cosmopolitan. Um, it's where a lot of expats like to stay. There is also Abu Dhabi, which is the capital. It's a lot more peaceful and, and you know, it also appeals to many expats for that reason. There's Sharjah, Ajman, Rasul Khaimah, Fajera, and Umal Queen as well. So um, Arabic is the official language in the UAE. Having said that, you have to remember that almost 90% of the population in the UAE is comprised of expats, so people from all over the world. So English is also widely spoken. It's just that, you know, when you come across government documentation and stuff, sometimes they will be in Arabic, but mostly, you know, you would find bilingual documents. Islam is the official religion. Having said that, um, UAE is a very tolerant country, so you will not have any issues in that respect in practicing your personal beliefs. 
Um, in terms of business days, yes, this can be a little different for people to get used to because the business days in the UAE is from Sunday to Thursday. So Friday and Saturday is the weekend, but, um, and I've always, you know, enjoyed my weekends here. You do, you do get to, you don't generally have this culture of working during weekends. Um, another thing that really attracts a lot of people to the UAE is the fact that it keeps changing and evolving. So for example, the UAE 10 years ago is so different from what it is now. And so because the economic climate as well is constantly changing, there is a lot of uh, avenues for, let's say, lawyers to tap into. Okay, so let me move to some of the meat. Let's talk about the political system. Now, um, well, you know, a lot of people assume when it comes to the UAE that it's just ruled by, you know, it's ruled by a, a ruler and, and that's how it is and he decides everything, but that's actually not the case. Um, the UAE is essentially a modified form of a federation and, um, and a monarchy. So the UAE does have a constitution. It's a very short constitution and it's worth reading online. So the constitution essentially allocates powers between the federal authorities as well as the emirates, which is essentially the states. So each of the emirates in turn is ruled by a sheikh and his power is hereditary. So essentially you do have a lot of federal authorities under the UAE constitution. For example, there is a federal judiciary, there is also a UAE cabinet, and the UAE cabinet is the entity which essentially, you know, issues laws and legislation, makes executive decisions. So yes, it's, it's, uh, the UAE is not exactly what you would think in terms of, you know, just a ruler or a shakedown where somebody just makes decisions. There is a proper procedure for making laws and legislation. So let's move to the legal system. And this is the part where it, it gets quite interesting for all of us. Now, again, when it comes to the UAE, sometimes, you know, a lot of us just assume that, oh, it's all about Sharia law. But that's actually not the case. This, the UAE is essentially a civil law system, which in a way is influenced by Sharia laws. So the UAE actually has a set of codified laws. So for example, the UAE has a civil code, it has a criminal code, it has companies law, it has evidence law, a competition law. Certain laws are more influenced by Sharia. For example, um, personal laws are influenced by Sharia. So for example, if there's a marital dispute, um, Sharia law is likely going to come into play as well as the criminal code is also influenced by Sharia. Having said that, if there is any criminal matter, what happens is it's, uh, I mean, you know, the criminal code is followed. Now, and, and just to give you another example from my personal experience, I'm a corporate and commercial lawyer. So I generally just rely on the company's law. I rely on all the corporate uh, laws and generally I've never really come across Sharia law as such. So, you know, we have a law, we just follow whatever that, you know, uh, whatever that's mentioned in the law and then that's how it is. Of course, there's market practice, but, but we generally, I have never really faced any issue with, uh, with, uh, you know, Sharia law coming into play in my corporate matters. Now, so that's one, and that's why it's quite easy for, let's say, an Indian lawyer or for a foreign lawyer to come here, because what you can do is once you read the laws, you can sort of get acquainted with the system and, and you can actually start practicing. Another interesting aspect about uh, the UAE is that it's not just a civil law system. So the UAE has multiple jurisdictions within the country. So just to give you, just to explain this, because this can be quite complicated for, you know, somebody who's new to the country. Um, the UE actually has two financial free zones. And those two financial free zones, they have their own courts and their own legal system, which is actually based 
on common law. So in Dubai, uh, one of the financial free zones, uh, we have the Dubai International Financial Center. That's the DIFC, which you will see in the presentation, DIFC. And then in Abu Dhabi, you have the Abu Dhabi Global Market. So that's the ADGM. Now, the DIFC and the ADGM, they have their own courts. And they have their, and, and in these courts, everything is in the English language. And this is essentially they're influenced by English law. So for example, you know, if I were based in the ADGM or if I had a dispute which was subject to ADGM laws and the ADGM courts, then the judges in the ADGM would actually follow English law. They would actually, you know, look at English precedent. So it's a common law system that's followed. Um, and, and that's where common law lawyers can actually play a big role in the UAE. Because again, just to give you another example, if you're an Indian lawyer, then we are sort of familiar with the English legal system because a lot of our laws are derived from English law. So for you to move and let's say get acquainted with the DIFC or ADGM laws, it's going to be a lot easier. And if you were to be a dispute resolution lawyer as well, you know, it would be sort of familiar with the, I mean, things would be a little more familiar for you. And uh, again, I can also give you another example in terms of our corporate contracts as well. Sometimes I subject it to DIFC laws or DIFC courts. So, you know, that is quite similar to what we've been practicing back in India or in any other country. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, I would say uh, there is a common law influence in the UAE as well. So don't think that it's just a civil law system. Uh, there's both civil law and common law in the UAE. And this is where you can use this to your advantage if you're moving to the UAE as a common law lawyer. In any event, if you're a civil law lawyer, that's also a big advantage. So both can coexist. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about the local courts because uh, the difference between the DIFC, ADGM and the local courts is that the local courts, everything happens in the Arabic language. Um, so yes, I mean, uh, if you're a true blue lit litigation lawyer, you might face a little bit of issues there. Having said that, uh, I have dealt with certain litigation matters and, and what happens is you, there's a lot of teamwork involved because you would have to, let's say, work with, you know, your colleague who's probably an Arabic speaking person. So you can sometimes just, you know, summarize the facts or arguments and provide it to your colleague and, you know, and then you can have a discussion on how to proceed with a particular case. Again, uh, uh, so this is where, you know, teamwork essentially plays a big role. Um, in terms of uh, the court system, it's quite straightforward. You do have a court of first instance, which is a trial court. You have a court of appeal, and you also have a Supreme Court. Sometimes, like in the case of Dubai, there is, uh, you know, Dubai and Russell Kema, they also have their own courts. But um, I'm not really going to talk much about that because that was probably going to complicate the discussion. What uh, the key point that I'm trying to say is that, um, you know, uh, there is room for lawyers from foreign jurisdictions as well. And you do not have to think that uh, the UAE is all about Sharia law or, you know, knowing the Arabic language. If you, you know, if you're good in English, you can, you can pretty much um, succeed in this, in this jurisdiction. So one question, uh, Piyasha. So when when people go to this, uh, you know, this this three, uh, you said you know, court of first instance, court of appeal, and court of cassation. So these exist even in the DIFC and ADG. Yeah, I mean, they have a very simple system. In fact, the DIFC and the ADGM, they they they're actually really trying to simplify the legal system. So the mm -hmm. DIFC, for example, they actually have a small claims tribunal. So, you know, for small matters, they try to avoid lawyers as well. So let's say there are two people who have a small dispute and it's a very small value. Uh, the DIC small claim, claims tribunal will try to get those parties to resolve the disputes themselves. Um, so yeah, they also have a very, they have a three 
tier system as well in the DIFC and the ADGM. And generally, you know, the matters proceed quite quickly as well because the caseload is not that high. Okay, but but they cannot go to the uh, the Supreme Court or whatever the Court of Cassation that is there cannot go there, right? They they need their own court because uh, yeah. So, so uh, think that, yeah. So you know there is uh, there is an agreement between these financial free zones and the local courts. So let's say that there is a let's say court of appeal in the DIFC. So let's say that I do get a judgment from the DIFC court, then I can actually go to the Dubai local court to get an enforcement judgment. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then first I have to go to the other court. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It depends on where the party is, right? Where you're enforcing your judgment. So let's say if the party is in the, the DIFC, then you do not have to go to the local court. But let's say your party against whom you want to enforce a judgment is in onshore UAE, then yes, you have to go to the local court to get an enforcement judgment. And that generally is not an issue. Right, but but people cannot go and go in appeal, right? People cannot go in appeal to uh, to the to the Dubai like other other courts outside the so Generally, that doesn't happen. No. Sometimes you can. I mean, sometimes you can. You can say that oh, you know, the DIFC did not have jurisdiction over this matter. So yes, I mean, I guess litigation lawyers, you know, there's always arguments for challenging you know, judgments and awards. So. Okay. <laughs> that is okay. But uh, how about, you know, uh, criminal cases, etc. in DIFC? What happens there? That's a good question. So again, because it's a quite, a, it is a little confusing in the sense that for criminal matters, you know, everything is subject to the local courts. So the police will have jurisdiction over any criminal matter, which happens in the DIFC or the ADGM. So that is the only exception when it comes to the DIFC and ADGM, uh, one of the key exceptions. So, so let's say that a crime or a murder is committed in DIFC, which is very unlikely to happen. Um, it will be subject, the Dubai court, the Dubai police will have jurisdiction and uh, you know, it, will, it will essentially go to the UAE courts. Sorry, hold on. Let me just go to the slide. Yeah. And of course, uh, the last point that I wanted to just say is that arbitration is also popular in the UAE. So let's say as a corporate lawyer, sometimes I would in my contract mention a subject, uh, you know, the dispute resolution clause to arbitration. So again, arbitration, you have a lot of flexibility. Um, you can have your proceedings in English. You can decide what laws you want to subject your contract to. So if you want to make it English law, you can do that. You can make it DIC laws, you can make it ADGM laws. So there is a lot of flexibility here. And uh, this is where, again, you know, a lawyer is, is uh, I mean, arbitration lawyers could. So yeah, arbitration is also popular in the UAE. You have a lot of uh, institutional arbitrations happening here. So if you're using, um, I mean, if you're, again, arbitration happens in the English language. So again, this is a scope for a lot of arbitration lawyers to actually, you know, uh, practice in the UAE. It's a competitive market, but yes, you do have scope here. Now, let me talk a little bit about the economy uh, because that might just help you as well in understanding what are the sectors which are flying. Sure, sure. And all of those who are waiting for information on how to get a job, hold on, we'll get there soon. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. we <laughs> this are. This is yeah. important background information before we start. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I can understand. Uh, that's the cherry in the pie. So, okay. Uh, there's a note here. Please explain more about criminal law. This is a problem why I don't uh, like to share screen on this thing because then others can come and write uh, stuff on okay. this. Okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll leave all the questions yeah, to yeah, the yeah, end. Yeah, okay. okay. Cool. So uh, in terms of the UAE economy, I'm going to quickly run through this because I think people want to know more about finding a job. So I'll just quickly run through this. Uh, so even though oil and gas has been, you know, the main key factor about the UAE economy. The government sort of knew that it, 
oil is a finite resource. And so right from many years ago, they've actually started the process of diversifying and liberalizing the economy. I think Dubai was one, one state that did not have uh, oil and then they had to focus on other stuff, right? Exactly. Dubai is definitely one. Yeah, it doesn't really have that much of oil. And that's why you'll see a lot of focus on finance, which is why it has the DIFC, uh, Dubai International Financial Center. There's a big focus on trading. Education is also a big sector because you'll actually see a lot of foreign universities opening their branches in the UAE. Also, a lot of schools, Indian schools are also doing well. There, there's, there are schools based on the UK system. There are schools based on the US system. So education is a big business here. Healthcare is, well, now we know it is important, an important sector. Tourism, of course. And in terms of transportation and logistics, aviation and shipping are big, um, big industries here because the UAE has a strategic location. And so... And so it's quite a transportation hub. There's a lot of construction happening. So even real estate is a big booming sector. Uh, a lot of construction disputes, construction arbitration. So if you're into construction arbitration, then I would say yes. I mean, you know, there is a lot of scope for you to tap into the market. Um, in general, in terms of doing business as well, UAE, the government always tries to make it easier. So unlike a lot of other countries, um, you know, decisions are made quickly and, and you know, they try to make it, uh, they, they try their best to make it easy to do business. And of course, there's also a no foreign exchange laws. So you can just transfer money out of the country without any issue. Um, the, U, the, the Middle East governments often have a long-term vision. So, you know, uh, for example, in 2010, they had launched a charter, you know, for the UAE to be, let's say, one of the best countries by 2021. And to a large extent, they have achieved that, you know, in terms of security, the UAE is actually very, very safe. So as a woman, you know, it, it's something that that uh, I find it quite beneficial because I can just, you know, walk out of the home at any time and not really feel threatened. So I've just quickly run through the slide because I, I wanted to make sure that I actually get the meat of the presentation again. I mean, the most, probably one of the interesting part, which is entry into the UAE legal market. So um, let me quickly go over this. First is why do people want to enter into the UAE? Why do you know foreign lawyers want to practice in the UAE? I'll tell you what are the attractions. Uh, the first is you do get a good salary and it's tax free. So let's say you, your offer letter mentions X amount, that's the amount that you will get into your bank account, no taxes. Um, second is it's quite a multicultural country. So you have people from all over the world, you know, lawyers from all over the world, businesses from all over the world. So you do get, I find it to be personally quite enriching because you do get to learn a lot from different people. Um, third is you have a comfortable lifestyle as well. Um, I have to say that in the UAE, you do get your work-life balance. So for example, for me, it's always been, I come to the office at 9 a.m. I actually get done by 6 or 7 p.m. And, uh, and generally, you know, of course, you do have your late nights, but that's quite rare. Also, weekends, generally, I've always had it, you know, I've always been free during my weekends. So you do get your work-life balance here. And of course, another... Uh, Advantage is the strategic location in the sense that, uh, especially for a lot of lawyers from India, um, you uh, it's it's very it's just a four hour or a three hour flight away. So you know that that's one of the big advantages. You're close to your home, or even for European lawyers, they're, they're quite close to their home as well. Um, so that's the good part. You know, now the. I wouldn't say the negative, but this is the difficult part. Uh, so the not so good part is that it's super competitive if you're a new lawyer in the market, you know, because you're competing with lawyers from all over the world. So you're competing with 
English lawyers, Canadian lawyers, Australian lawyers. Um, so you really have to work hard at standing out. Having said that, it's not, you know, I will give you some tips uh, which you can actually use to sort of get that competitive edge. Uh, and I will get to that uh, shortly. In terms of uh, demography, as I mentioned, uh, it's, you know, you have a mix of civil and common law lawyers. As I mentioned, because the litigation practice is essentially in the Arabic language, a lot of civil lawyers from the Arab region will dominate just a local litigation practice because a lot of them are also bilingual and they know Arabic. So you'd see a lot of people from Egypt, Jordan, Sudan, Syria and Lebanon practicing litigation. And then, of course, another thing is you do have a lot of English law firms in, uh, you know, in, in the UAE. So you'd have a lot of English law lawyers. You'll see them. Most of them are in the DIFC. Um, a lot of dispute resolution lawyers as well. Uh, again, like I said, a lot of contracts tend to be governed by English law. So English law firms, uh, a lot of English law lawyers in the UAE. Apart from that, apart from, you know, the Arab lawyers and the English lawyers, you also have people, again, like I said, from all over the world, Australia, Canada, India, Pakistan, the African region. So everybody's competing for a share in the pie. So you have to remember that, you know what, you really, really have to stand out. And of course, sometimes there's also luck involved. Now, uh, just a quick... Uh, you know, note, and that's, uh, you know, when you're a foreign law lawyer, you actually are registered as a legal consultant. So we don't really call ourselves lawyers, we call ourselves legal consultants, because only UAE nationals have a right of audience before the local courts. So only UAE nationals can appear before local courts. Uh, and this does not include the DIC or the ADGM. The IFC, you can register yourself as a common law lawyer and practice before the DIFC courts. Um, the only, having said that, you know, uh, I see a lot of people from, let's say, Egypt, Jordan, or what they do is still, you know, in a way, practicing before local courts. They don't really appear before the court, but they do all the drafting, they prepare all the arguments, they just hand it over to a UA national, and the UA national files it before the court. So that's, in a way, a brief overview of how actually it works in the local courts. Um, Great. So, uh, you know, I have heard that uh, from several people that, uh, you know, learning Arabic takes about one or two years. And you are going to, if you are going to stay in UAE and you, you stay there for a year or two and you realize that you want to continue, then it's, a, it's of great benefit to learn some Arabic, apparently law firms and everybody else prefers that if, if you know some Arabic, is that correct? Well, a good question. Uh, the thing is that, you know, again, because I was sort of uh, in the country as well, I also learned a little bit of Arabic, but it's not enough to, um, it's not really enough to start drafting in Arabic, you know, so maybe sometimes it would help me read maybe a few alphabets here and there but or understand maybe a few words here and there but otherwise you know any language you require a lot it requires a lot of hard work to master it what i've seen is that a lot of people don't tend to master arabic i mean especially foreign lawyers um, you do learn a little bit but i haven't seen anybody really master the language and those are very i think rare people who actually master the language so that you can actually use it in you know, so use it in your profession. Because even sometimes, even the Arabic people themselves, they also face issues because Arabic is a very, you know, rich language. So I have seen, let's say, uh, you know, people, Arab nationals who have been brought up, let's say in Canada or in the UK, they do know Arabic, they can speak Arabic, but they do face difficulties when it comes to understanding some of the legal technical terms. So it helps to know. It helps to know definitely, but uh, to master it and to be very comfortable with it in order to actually practice in local courts, I, I think that is 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 not is is generally not really 
you know, practically, let's say, feasible. But, you know, as a corporate lawyer, I don't really, I mean, you, you know, people speak English here. So a lot of times I have gone to government authorities and, you know, I, if you speak to them nicely, if you explain things to them, they will, they will generally, you know, listen to you. It's just the local courts where you probably just need to submit your documents in Arabic. So I have pretty much survived without knowing Arabic. Right, right, right. You don't exactly need to know. But of course, yeah. it's good to learn. Got it, got it. And, and what is your, uh, like, you know, when you, when you first arrived in Dubai, what were your challenges? Like, what, how, first of all, how did you get a job and how did you arrive in Dubai? And, you know, uh, what were your apprehensions? And then once you, jo- you know, arrived in Dubai, what were your, like, initial challenges? Yeah. Feeling yeah. difficulties, yeah. Yeah, so I'm actually just going to get to that. So maybe, uh, yeah, because I think that's actually one of the most, uh, one of the interesting parts about the presentation. But before I just uh, get into that, I'm just going to give you a quick overview about, you know, uh, whether you actually need to clear any exam to write, to practice in the UAE. Because let's say you go to the UK or you go to the US, you actually need to clear a bar exam. But that's not the case in the UAE. In the UAE, if you're qualified in your home country, then you can actually practice in the UAE. So there's no exam that you need to pass. I'm not really gonna go into the details and maybe I'll get to that later. But yeah, I mean, uh, actually let me just get into uh, the story about how I got into the UAE and all this will sort of start fitting in. So I actually, uh, you know, I was working in Mumbai for five years and I wanted to take a break. I was quite burnt out. And that's when I had taken a break where I was doing some traveling. And I also in my head, I sort of always wanted to practice abroad just to get that international experience. And so the UAE was one of the jurisdictions that I was sort of considering and I decided to focus on in Dubai. Now, one of the things that the challenges that I faced was that, you know, I was expecting things to be a little easier because in India, let's say I was working at a top tier law firm. I had, let's say, graduated from National Law University, Jodhpur. So I thought, oh, you know what, maybe people know about the law firm and, you know, at least they will give me some attention. But I soon realized that that really wasn't the case. So, you know, let's say I would apply for opportunities on LinkedIn or in any of these job boards and I wouldn't really hear back. So that's when I realized that, okay, I was doing something wrong. And, and so I, I reached out to some, some of my friends and acquaintances who I knew in Dubai. So I spoke to them and then they told me the true picture, which is, it's very difficult to find an opportunity here and you have to you have to be lucky you have to be persistent and uh, especially when you're somebody from let's say india or or pakistan or one of the non-western jurisdiction it becomes quite difficult and and i think i can understand now why because for example i would a lot of recruiters would not really respond to me and one of the things that I realized after entering Dubai is that, you know, recruiters, they get almost like thousand applications for a particular position. So how- I think that is a problem everywhere, right? In India also, in any, any decent law firm, if you just put out one, people are afraid of putting out any kind of, uh, you know, uh, invitation for applications because they'll get flooded with irrelevant applications and thousands and thousands of applications. So, yeah, possibly. I, I'm guessing, yeah, that probably happens in India as well. It's just that, like, I, I, just to give you an example, like, in India, I never really faced any issues. You know, let's say if I had to consider moving, there would always be recruiters contacting me, saying that, hey, you want to consider the, this role in this law firm. Um, but yeah, that doesn't exactly happen in the UAE if you're a foreign lawyer with no UAE experience. So, um, so... And then I realized that okay, fine. I think I think that is the, that is the challenge. Even even when in India, like because you were already in a big law firm, so you were you were part of one of those people. But whenever whenever anybody wants to get a, a good job and they are not part of the circle, they face the challenge. So whenever you're an outsider, you probably face that challenge. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when you are in UAE, uh, I mean, 
it's interesting because even yesterday i like uh, partner of a very big firm reached out to me yesterday and said that can you recommend somebody who uh, you know an an indian lawyer that you want to hire in dubai with, with uh, but but with with experience of having worked in big law firms in india right so i think that is a challenge that everybody faces that you know how can we select people uh, who have uh like you know like who are who are credible because it becomes even more difficult to judge the credibility of a person when it is in a different country perhaps right because uh, you know uh, yep yep yeah i think what the issue, the issue is that also uh, one of the in india the barriers to entry of law is quite low so we don't have a very stringent bar exam so it becomes very difficult to understand the quality of an indian lawyer you know for let's say an hr person who recruited in the uae they don't know okay is this person actually good so yeah. what tends to happen is that in all their advertisements recruiters are generally looking for people who are qualified in the uk so that was another challenge that i faced every time i would look at an ad it would say okay you know what don't apply unless you have uk qualification or some international western qualification so that was the other challenge that i was facing so that when i realized that okay you know what i have to change my approach this is uh, the general simple approach of applying for job that's not going to work i have to change yeah so, so what did you do after that yeah so after that when that wasn't working that's when i realized that okay fine i have to leverage linkedin So I was still in India at that time. The advantage was that I was still in my break, so I had a lot of time. So what I started doing was that I started connecting with people on LinkedIn, so connecting with different lawyers. Um, and then again, I made that was another mistake that I made. What I would do is I would connect with people on LinkedIn, and then there I would send them a short message saying that, "Oh, you know, hi, I'm Priyasha." I've worked in Trilegal. I'm looking for an opportunity in the UAE. I've worked in M&A deals and all of that. And again, people were not responding. And that's when I realized that you know, again, I I learned later why people don't respond. And and that's because they receive so many such messages every day. So you know, it's not really easy to respond to everybody, right? so again you have to stand out you can't and also sometimes people will just politely say yeah 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 i will see what i can do but what that means is that look i don't they, who has time to sit and like you know help you know 20 strangers every day like... exactly exactly because it's it is actually 20 strangers how can you it's not possible right you have so many yeah, yeah. so much work to do so you if can't if you have... got one person every week you will be like ha ha theek hai definitely why not let me do this but when because of uh, linkedin and email and everybody if they are like every day you are getting lots of those messages you just want to you you want it to stop you don't know, don't want to even read those messages right so that's the challenge yeah. so yeah, how so do you stand out that how can you be there one person in a month or one person in a year who reached out in such a way that you want to help them yeah exactly so this is where again uh, i've given some tips and this is all these slides are actually intertwined so what i did was that i again i realized that okay i have to change my approach so i what i started doing is that i started changing my messages so what i would tell people is that okay you know um i am interested in exploring the ua market you know i've come across a profile i was wondering if you could give me some advice on what to do uh you know how to approach the market and i wouldn't really say i'm looking for a job i would just say that hey i'm just uh exploring the market and I want to learn more about the UAE legal market. So when you ask people for advice then it becomes a little difficult to say no. So again yeah, of course people, not- people like giving advice you know and and you know uh, this is an interesting thing in in, in, the, in the venture capital world it is said that if you ask people for advice they will invest in your company but if you ask people for investment they'll give advice. <laughs> so yeah exactly. Uh, people people don't mind giving advice but then again you have to be you Uh, again this is what i'm discussing in the last you know in, in my last slide which is networking tips is that you uh, you need to break the ice before approaching a stranger so for example let's say you want to ask somebody out on a date you're not just going to go to that person and be like oh hey can you would you want to go out with me no you have to you know break the ice you have to learn a little bit more about that person you have to 
you know, you have to maybe say something nice about that person first. So let's say that you're approaching somebody on LinkedIn. Just say that, hey, you know, I've read your articles and I've found it quite useful. Uh, let's say you're a competition law lawyer. So you can say that, oh, you know what? I also, I've done my LLM in competition law and, um, you know, I found this article of yours quite insightful. Then right. you can say that, hey, you know, I'm exploring the market. Do you think you would have 15 minutes, just 15 minutes, just to give me some advice? Uh, you know, when you, when, you, when you send such a message, then it becomes difficult for somebody to say no. Yeah, I, I think what is important is to like, you know, uh, build that credibility and take it step by step. Like I think your date analogy is very on point. So for example, if you want to uh, go out on a date with somebody you have never spoken to that person, you just don't tell them, hey, can we just yeah, do exactly. it? So you'll, you'll, you'll say that, okay, can you, you, may, you may actually exchange a few messages and then one day you'll get on a call or maybe you, you do some kind of a video conference, you get advice and eventually, and you may go and meet you don't say you give me a job right now or you connect me with a job, right? So, and the other thing I think is important is that uh, you need to demonstrate that you have some high value. Like, you know, there are, uh, this is a profession where only the, uh, you know, people who are really credible would have any opportunity. So if you're asking for something that many people want, then definitely you need to demonstrate your quality and there is no other option, right? So, uh, yeah, so exactly. I think one of the things that you can do step by step is again, this is what worked for me because again, I was connecting with lawyers and what I did was I started writing articles on LinkedIn. So, and I would share it. So when you sh write articles on LinkedIn, all your connections, you know, they get an update. So let's say that I've connected with somebody, then they see that, oh, you know what, Priyash has written an article. They read it and maybe they like the article. So at least they know that, you know what, she, this is her standard or this is her quality. So, you know, if, if, it, if it's something that appeals to them, then they might just be more open towards, you know, um, actually responding to your message. Another point that I would say is that sometimes, yes, people are busy. So let's say you've sent a respect, respectful message um, and somebody doesn't respond to you. I would say that follow up with the person. Just send another message one week down the line, a very respectful message. And more often than not, when you follow up, people generally will get back to you. But don't be demanding. Don't be like, hey, I sent you this message. Message, You know, you haven't responded to me. Just be like, hey, um, you know, uh, I will be very grateful for your time. I know you're very busy. But, uh, you know, if you can just spare 10 to 15 minutes of your time, I'd be very grateful. So I would say always be respectful when, you know, you're approaching people. Right, right. And be uh, active on LinkedIn because LinkedIn is quite popular in the Middle East in general, including the UAE. So if you're active, if you're actually sharing relevant information, you know, things which actually appeal to an employer or yeah, I think I think people uh, often like you know do not fully appreciate the importance of incoming uh, conversations because just like you know you are applying for jobs there are a lot of people looking for good quality people and sometimes they're looking for Indian lawyers very specific yeah, exactly right? exactly in fact there are a lot of companies which actually actually specifically look for Indian lawyers because let's say it's an Indian company or also well I mean, I, do, I hate making stereotypes, but sometimes with Indian lawyers as well, you know, the expectations in terms of salary, they're not that high. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, you also do get value. So, right. so sometimes, yes, you do have people specifically looking for Indian lawyers. Um, people do look for Indian lawyers also because they have a lot of Dubai, India trade is like, you know, in a, you know, at an all time high and there is just so much work, right? I mean, tell, tell us a little about that also. Like there were lawyers who were asking questions about, uh, can an Indian law firm also get Dubai related work? I have some experience about it that I'll share with you uh, in, a, in a bit, but why don't you tell Piyasha person what has been your experience? Um, well, yeah, I would say that, uh, in fact, a lot of my clients while I was practicing, they used to be actually from Europe or other countries, but I did have Indian clients as well. For example, there was an infrastructure company, let's say in India, which was facing insolvency. So they had subsidiaries in the UAE and they needed to 
you know, and they needed to essentially wind up those com uh, companies or to sell off those companies. So we were actually uh, interacting with lawyers from Amarchand because Amarchand was the Indian law firm that was, you know, that was handling the entire transaction. So for all the UAE law aspects, they were reaching out to us. Uh, similarly, there have been deals when, let's say, you know, uh, let's say a company is acquiring a large business and that large business has, you know, a com like a subsidiary in India. So yes, we do have to reach out to Indian lawyers. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of deals that happen between Dubai and India. Also, I would say the education sector is another one. You do have a lot of, uh, you do have a lot of uh, uh, Indian companies as well here. So, you know, an Indian company would obviously prefer somebody who also understands the Indian legal system. So that tends to happen a lot. Um, so yeah, I would say there definitely is. Yeah, I have I have also noticed that you know any company in India which is doing shipping, they have very close relationship with Dubai. So almost anybody who's doing any shipping law practice end up working having some relationship with Dubai. Plus Indian exporters and importers and any big companies like you know I have uh, batchmates who are working in Dubai because they are uh, in-house counsels in Indian companies at their Dubai bases. Yeah, so, exactly. So you're right about that. In fact, I was working for a law firm which had a very strong shipping practice and that shipping practice, one of the shipping partners was, uh, you know, from Mumbai. So he had very strong connections with all the traders and he was doing a lot of work for Indian companies and it was very profitable, I would say, his practice. So, so yes, I mean, uh, you do have a lot of scope for like, I would say shipping, corporate also, corporate also is, is you do have a lot to do. It, it is competitive though, the corporate and commercial practice. But yes, I mean, a lot of in-house roles, you have landmark as well. Yeah. So, you know, let's say landmark, they would be looking out for Indian lawyers. Um, you have a lot of, I've seen a lot of oil and gas companies as well. Sometimes they're specifically looking for an Indian lawyer. There's right. a lot of right. LNT. It's a lot of Indian companies here. That's where India is exporting a lot of things to Dubai. I think, for example, clothes to you know FMCG goods and like you know electronics. Sometimes there's so much, so many of things that go from India to UA. At uh, so so all of those companies are beginning to hire lawyers either in Dubai or work with law firms in Dubai, and they prefer to work with Indian experienced lawyers. Uh, no, that's true. That's true. I mean, uh, like I said, definitely there, there is, when you look at the population in the UAE, majority of the people in the UAE are Indians. So, of course, what, what does that mean? It means that there are a lot of people from India doing business in the UAE. And so, yes, there is, there is definitely a requirement, a need for Indian lawyers. And likewise, you would actually find a lot of Indian lawyers in the UAE. You just have to know, you know, the right avenues to approach. Now, another also, thing, how, how would you say about the rest of the Middle East? Because if you're in Dubai, it's a great place to tap into the rest of the Middle Eastern business as well, right? Because for a lawyer and law, law firms do work for other countries as well. Like if, if you can tell us something about that. You mean uh, UAE's connections with other Middle East countries? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and whether law firms are serving others, uh, like other countries also sitting in Dubai or... or yeah, I mean, that tends to happen a lot. Like, for example, there are times when, let's say we were working on an acquisition and this company had subsidiaries all over the Middle East. So, yeah, we were sort of coordinating the documentation from Dubai for the other countries as well. Of course, we were dealing with other law firms, local law firms in the other countries. But yes, you do uh, often tend to... Investors uh, kind of tend to see Dubai as one-stop shop or even, even larger... Yeah. People look at it as a one-stop shop. Also, you know, UAE also has quite a close connection with Saudi Arabia. So you'd actually see a lot of consultants who are based in Dubai, but they actually keep traveling to Saudi to do work. So I do think that in the future, there will be a lot of legal work as well between the UAE and Saudi, because a lot of Saudi companies, they come and set up in the UAE. Similarly, Saudi, there's a lot of development happening. So there's so much of work going on there that I feel that, you know, uh, at some point, 
you know, there would also be some sort of a legal connection between the two countries for lawyers as well. So I would say that is one area where all of you should definitely possibly, you know, uh, look at if you're okay. I mean, if someone's okay with the whole idea of, uh, you know, working in Saudi Arabia, that definitely is uh, an, you know, a different one, volume. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a country where there's going to be a lot of work coming soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, if you can, if you can just, you know, let's say there's somebody today in India who's, uh, who's doing uh, commercial corporate work or doing arbitration. I don't think if they're doing purely litigation, there's too much opportunity. But if they want, like we had a few students who have uh, shifted to Dubai and then got jobs there. So I'll quickly share that experience as well. We have had people from uh, Bahrain and other, other countries who are like, you know, uh, who have been lawyers and did other things and they're starting a second innings in law and they have uh, done our courses and then we have those we have helped them also in their job and we'll share that experience also but from your experience what would you say that if somebody wants to get a job in the UA today and they are in India and they are working either in a law firm let's not assume tier one law firm let's say some other law firm okay. and uh, or maybe they are doing arbitration in India. If they look to move to UAE, then what should be the approach towards? Yeah, so I would say, you know, there is opportunity for you, even if you are, if you are, let's say, working in the UAE, I'm sorry, working in India. Uh, litigation, uh, yes, it, it can be slightly more challenging because here, like I said, litigation happens in you know, Arabic. Having said that, I've seen a lot of lawyers who actually are litigation lawyers and they are actually practicing litigation in the UAE. So what they do is that they're the ones who act as like, let's say the middleman between the Arabic lawyers as well as the clients. So for example, you're, because I guess most of the participants today are from India. So let's say that you're an Indian lawyer and you're working at, an, at a firm and the client is an Indian person. So, you know, the Indian person, the Indian client would be more comfortable speaking to an Indian lawyer. So you become that interface. So you, you know, discuss the legal dispute or the legal issue with your client, you understand that. And, you know, I mean, when you spend, let's say six months in the UAE, you sort of even understand the laws. So you can get an idea about how the court system works. And so you can give a little bit of advice to your Indian client. And then you also discuss it with your Arabic speaking colleague. And anyways, he's part of your team. So it's all teamwork. So, um, so, and you can also sort of discuss arguments with your Arabic speaking colleagues and stuff. So I would say you still, as a litigation lawyer, you still can get a, you know, you know, get a foot into the market. It's just that you have to work extra hard because uh, opportunities, people are not specifically looking for Indian lawyers for litigation work. But mm -hmm. like I said, I have worked on litigation matters. I've worked on bankruptcy matters where the client is Indian, but of course they want to, you know, deal with me because I'm Indian. And I sort of act as that interface. Right, right. Uh, if you're a corporate and commercial lawyer, again, like I said, you have opportunities here. You just have to, um, you just have to work extra hard on your networking. So, like I said, if you know somebody here, then reach out to that person, ask them for advice, send them your CV. So, for instance, let's say if a friend approaches me and. I, pro I might not have an opportunity at the firm where I'm working, but I can always, you know, send her CV to somebody else. Right, right. Referrals really work uh, well here. So right, right. referral will work great. So, you know, I have a question, like I'm going to suggest there are a lot of people who are very eager to see rest of your presentation. Uh, but before we move to that, just a quick one, uh, uh, you know, so what, what like uh, summarizing what we have seen working, one is that visiting UA really works. So I have seen people who have not been trying to get a job and not succeeded for six months, uh, writing to people, but the moment they went to Dubai for say 14 days, and I, I have seen this again and again, like they meet, let's say uh, for 10 days, 12 days, they meet a lot of companies and uh, mostly Indian businesses and connection and, uh, you know, they just don't get anything. Right. And then the last one or two days, they got lots of offers. And I have seen this happening again and again. It's just because if you're in front of them, there is a higher level yeah. of interest. Right. 
this is uh, this is exactly what worked for me as well because I was connecting with people on LinkedIn and and then what I would do is I would send them a message saying that hey I'm traveling to the UAE between these dates would you be available for a coffee meeting so this is what I mentioned at the end uh, here you know trip to the UAE head so I was setting up coffee meetings and I would meet them and when they see you in front of them and they know that you are available to take a job then, you know, they're more conducive to giving you an opportunity. So in my case, what happened was I had connected with people, I had shared articles. So one of the partners, he liked one of my articles. So when I was, when I told him that, hey, I'm traveling to the UAE and, uh, mm. you know, coming for a meeting, or I mean, coming for a few weeks, he was open to that idea. And then we had, in a way, we sort of even had an interview and that's how, you know, I got my first opportunity. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess another tip that I would just say is that don't be too desperate, you know, know your value, know your worth, mm-hmm. uh, do some research before coming here in terms of, uh, you know, what's the, uh, what's the standard of living. So I can actually share some resources with you sure, sure, sure. at the end in terms of how to understand what is the value. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's what I would say when you make a trip to the UAE and you meet people, uh, definitely that would increase your chance. So Great. this can be another webinar as well, but I can give you a short overview about the QLTs. What is the question specifically? Nothing. They, I think somebody wanted you to mention okay. about QLTS gig. Okay. Right? Okay. Just talk about QLTS gig for me. Yeah, I would just say that uh, QLTS is something that, again, it, you know, it's, it's just like an additional qualification and it helps you get more attention. So it's, it's again, it's, it's your way to become an English solicitor. So let's say that you do, you do have this qualification then you might just get an edge when you're applying to an English law firm. Having said that, I did get an opportunity in the UAE without... Uh, without you know without the QLTS qualification it's only once I moved to the UAE that I you know wrote the QLTS and and got the opportunity so the question is how important and helpful it is to clear QLTS to get into the UAE market so like I said it definitely helps to have some people don't know what is QLTS so they're asking I'm sorry what is QLTS QLTS is qualified lawyers transfer screen this is for Indian lawyers or any other outside lawyers to practice in the in in london right in in uh, in uk yeah yeah so because you have a lot of english law firms here so what they do is that they always ask hey we want to see you qualified as a uk solicitor before applying so so yeah i mean like i said this qualification helps you get an edge uh, so let's say now, now that I'm in the UAE and now I've got the QLTS qualification, if I'm applying for an opportunity, you know, I might just have an edge over the other candidates because, you know, it's an additional qualification. And for me, I look at, I look at it as a long term goal that I think that in the future for me to be dual qualified, it helps me get an edge over somebody else, you know? Right, right. I think that that that's a very interesting uh, this thing, and people can write this QLTS without having to go to UK or Dubai. They can write it right from India, yeah. right? And the fact that they are a law graduate, they are they are, they can write it. Correct? Yeah. So your uh, initial, uh, so your the first level, which is MCT, is you can write it from India, but your second level, which is OSCE, you have to go to the UK to write the exam. So it is a two-step process mm-hmm. great so uh, but but they are qualified you don't have to do an llm or something from uk to just uh, you know write the exam right oh no so that's the one of the good things about the qlts is that you can actually they don't really yeah. ask you for even your documents before you write the exam so in my opinion i think you could even be a final year student and you can write the first level of the exam and you can then get your bar qualification in India and then actually even get UK qualified. Right. So I would definitely say, um, I would definitely say it's, it's a good thing to have and, and, but it's expensive. So I would say that, you know, you have, you, you definitely have to think about it. And uh, I'm happy to have a chat on that because there's a lot that I can actually speak on QLTS. QLTS, is, right, right. So uh, there's a question from Nadia Khan and I think this is a question that many people would have on yeah. their mind and I think very important question and she had told me this even before the session, what to do, like, you know, it's a catch-22 situation that I don't have UAE experience. I know Nadia is 
in Dubai perhaps already and she is looking for a job. So, uh, you know, if somebody doesn't have UAE experience, how can they create UAE experience? There is, there is a, there's some suggestion I have as well, but maybe you start. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, like I said in my presentation, uh, you know, even based on my personal experience, I did not have UAE experience when I was in the UAE. So how do you differentiate yourself? Uh, first is what you need to understand what employers are looking for. So employers are actually looking for somebody who's a very quick learner who can get the job done quickly. Uh, they don't want to train you because in, in the UAE, there's, there's no culture of uh, training, you know, training people because everybody just wants somebody who can pick up things uh, quickly. So, if you are somebody who has experience in some other country, then I would say that, yes, you can, you'll have to somehow, you know, show the employer that those skills are transferable in the UAE. And that's what I guess worked in my case as well, because I was talking about the deals that I worked in India. So, you know, the employees sort of got to know that, okay, fine, you know what, I can draft contracts, I can quickly draft contracts. And drafting contracts is not really different in India or the UAE. There are certain things that you would have to change in a contract in the UAE, but you know, the skills are largely the same. They want somebody who can quickly draft something. And I think law seeker- There's a also funny question. There's a funny question. There's somebody asking, ma'am, do you ever feel like, why did I want to work in UAE in the first place? Um, <laughs> did you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like, oh, I shouldn't have come to you? <laughs> it's an interesting. Yeah, I, well, actually, I, I don't really feel that way, but <laughs> that's also because, like I said, everybody's goals in life are different. Um, well, right, right. <laughs> right so UAE is not a very sophisticated jurisdiction when it comes to law so I would have to say that if you are super ambitious in law then you might want to consider Singapore or the UK because there you actually get the quality of work is a lot more better UAE is slightly simple simple in terms of the practice of law so I do know that if I were to move to another country I will definitely face issues <laughs> Because uh, the UE can be sort of very simple. So once I move to another country, or let's say if I were to move, move to the UK, I would know I would definitely have to up my game. Right. And that's one thing that a lot of UE lawyers know that mm -hmm. once you start working here, you do get a bit spoiled. <laughs> so you know, on Nadia's question, there's a very uh, you know I have a couple of uh, suggestions, and you can you can validate if they're correct. So one thing is to do is definitely look for companies which are which is doing a lot of business with. Uh, UAE and that is one place to start because if you are already in a company working there in UAE and then let you let's say you for a personal reason you shift to UAE then the company would be much more open to giving you a role in UAE right so I know this has happened with uh, say some friends who have been working in Reliance and then then they had to shift to UAE for some reason and Reliance was willing to give them a posting in Dubai because they already have been working in India in the company the other thing I have seen is that, you know, if you work, you know, there are some lawyers in India who specialize and they do a lot of work for Dubai. So if you can somehow get, get a chance to work with them, you will be able to build a Dubai focused CV. Like you'll be able to say, you know, there are so many uh, things about Dubai that I have done in the past and that kind of, uh, you know, gives you a uh, step up when you are going there. The other thing is yeah, obviously... Yeah, yeah, just, just I'll finish a couple of bullet points. Another couple of things is that, you know, you must write articles related to Dubai, for example, or you can collaborate with people, lawyers who are in Dubai to write articles jointly with them. So, for example, there are a lot of people who are writing articles, say, on arbitration and, you know, Dubai free trade zones and, uh, and, and they are, say, doing a comparative study of Indian, you know, how does Indian ACZ differ from Dubai free trade zones? And if you do this kind of collaborative work, very soon you'll be able to show to future employers and also you'll be building relationships in Dubai. So, you know, if you go to somebody with a proposal of writing an article which has a you know, comparative, uh, this thing, and it will be useful. So, for example, if I approach a lawyer in Dubai today or a law firm in Dubai today, I would offer to them to see how I can help them in India. Like, you know, what can they do to attract more Indian clients? Like, who are, who are the people from India doing business? And if I start helping them out in that way, then when I actually am looking for a job, it's a natural extension. So it's a great place to start from to see and understand that what is their practice like and if they have an interest in Indian practice and if you can help them to connect with big Indian businesses in any way, right? So you might be able to help them to write articles or create videos or organize maybe a conference in India for all you know, right? 
So if you are able to do those things, maybe you can do a webinar for them, right? So how about you do organize a webinar for people? There's a jewelry, India, Dubai jewelry business is huge, right? So how about you figure out some export related, very specific thing that is relevant and you know, you invite a Dubai law firm partner to speak in that and give him a relevant audience. He'll be very happy and he'll be amazed that you were able to help. So you, you deepen the relationship, you demonstrate high value. And I think from there it becomes easier. So it's okay if you don't have Dubai related experience, you have India experience, leverage that to connect, create a bridge with Dubai. I think yeah, what yeah. you yeah, I think you would, if you can, like, as you just said, if you can show that, you know, you could actually attract a lot of Indian clients, that would definitely be an attraction. So you have to show the... Yeah, in fact, of- even without attracting, if you just show that you have like some, you know, you are, you're useful, like, you know, you, you haven't yeah. been able to maybe provide them with a client or two, but just by doing things that, okay, you can do business development in India. I mean, that also, I think, goes a long way. Do yeah, I see one question. Do we have to qualify any exam to practice in the UAE? No, you just need your uh, law degree from India and uh, or from your home country. And you need, if it's in Dubai, then you need, you might also need like a certificate of good standing from like, let's say a bar council. Okay. Um, what is the scope for technology practice in the UAE? Are there, in fact, I know a lot of lawyers who are practicing technology law in the UAE. There's a lot of focus on the tech sector. So I would say it's quite, it's very, very huge. It's, it's a market, a huge market that you can tap in, into. And if you can show that you can understand technology, you understand blockchain and all of that, definitely, I would say, um, you know, you, you would definitely have an edge. But like I said, there are challenges in the UAE to get an opportunity, but these are the ways that you, you know, you can start. I remember that uh, Dubai wanted to bring its entire governance on blockchain, which was a big deal amongst all the blockchain. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that the Dubai government is, they're looking at becoming a smart city. So they are doing a lot of things in the technology sector. They are, uh, there's a big focus on fintech. There's, there's a lot of focus on startups. And so, you know, if you understand, you know, technology, I, I think your skills in India would be definitely transferable in the UAE. Right. So there is a scope. Uh, there's another question. What is the scope for family law for expat lawyers? Um, again, family law, there is scope. I see a lot of Indian lawyers practicing divorce or even family law because here again, a huge, huge Indian population, right? Yeah, there's a huge Indian population. So you're in, you, a lot of Indian clients might just reach out to you uh, for maybe even for drafting wills, succession, you know, people will end up reaching out to you. You will just have to learn about the local laws a little bit. So <clears throat> there, are, there are lots and lots of questions, Piyasha. There's a question about, uh, you know, how can Indian law firms, uh, you know, expand to UAE or can they start some work in UAE? I have seen a couple of my friends getting work from UAE. I'll share that quickly, but before first, Piyasha, please. Yeah, so if you're, a, if you're an Indian law firm who's looking to move to the UAE, I would say just maybe just drop me a message on LinkedIn. Uh, connect with me and drop me a message on LinkedIn because I'm working with, uh, you know, again, another management consultant and we're sort of helping law firms from other countries also move to the UAE. Great, so... Great. So that's one thing that definitely uh, we can, we can uh, you know, collaborate over. Moving to Dubai is slightly difficult, but you can always set up uh, a legal consultancy in Abu Dhabi or Sharjah. And that's what we're sort of uh, helping foreign law. I think what most people want to start with is to just get a few clients from UAE, right? Like, I mean, that, that would be... Exactly. Huh. In, fact, in fact, the consultant that I'm working with also, uh, they also help with lead generation. So right. let's say that you're in... A, Indian lawyer or a law firm who's moved to the UAE and you're setting up, then there is, uh, there is, we do provide help with lead generation too. Uh, of course, you do need to have some sort of a, you know, some sort of a UAE experience as well, but maybe that is something that you can get. You can hire, like, let's say you can hire an Indian lawyer who has UAE experience and they can be, you know, the person heading your India desk in, uh, sorry, heading your UAE sort of law firm. So, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, so, so I have seen many uh, law firm partners visiting Dubai, like, you know, once in six months and then meeting people, meeting law, other law firms, meeting potential clients, potential, uh, you know, and, and just having meetings and one-on-one meetings doing maybe 20, 30 of them in a week and coming back and then going back six months later. 
better again and if you the idea is that if you meet you know 20 30 people you maybe two three of them start referring work after a few months right so and and, and it also depends on how well you keep in touch with them through your newsletters or even messages etc email exchanges information yeah, i mean marketing is something that every lawyer must learn so you know if you're So marketing skills are essentially always sort of staying relevant being in touch with people making sure that people keep remembering you so if you're making a business development trip to the UAE i would say meet with indian partners of different law firms attend conferences then people will remember you and and you know if you're always in front of that person you know that person will ultimately reach out to you for something got it There's a very interesting question from Afif. He's asking, you know, what is the view of like, like how is Western education viewed? So, if you have education from like an American top-notch American or UK university, then how is that viewed? I mean, does it help to get a job in Dubai or how does? It uh, yeah, I think Western education definitely does help. I've seen a lot of people who've done, let's say, LLM in the US or the UK, and they actually get opportunities here. It does give you a bit of an edge because, again, I think it shows that you know what this person has had like some international experience. So uh, again, it's competitive, but when you do have international qualifications, it does give you an edge, and also you know it would sort of also give you some uh, networking. Uh, sort of opportunities because you can reach out to alumni from your LLM university you you know you can uh, i mean i would say it helps llm helps yeah. i didn't have an llm though i mean when i moved to the ue i didn't have llm i didn't have qlts but like i said it was all networking yep yep so there is a question about internship in uh, uh, getting an internship in dubai law firm this is a very interesting question i have been asked by some people from uae to refer uh, you know interns at times but the challenge i find is that most of them you know uh, they have to earn a living wage to stay in the uae i don't know what is if they i don't think there's any rule against unpaid internship or anything in uae so it is it's quite easy to get an internship in a way like but it may be unpaid and then how will you manage your living exchange uh, expenses with being a expensive city is a question right um yeah i mean i think that can be a bit of a challenge uh, generally the people who do internships here are people who have family here so they stay with their family and that's how they intern at a law firm so i it would be quite expensive even if i mean i i i don't i wouldn't have seen myself doing an unpaid internship here because it's quite expensive to live and quite even expensive. though i worked in india for 5 years i did have savings Uh, I I don't think I would have worked right. here and paid it. Yeah, but but uh, traveling to UAE is not that difficult. It's quite cheap, so you can go there and for like uh, spend like a few days and try to get an internship, which is possible, right? Which which some of some of our students have successfully done. So they have mm-hmm. traveled to UAE for seven days and met people and then have landed paid internships. How do land paid internships in UAE? If you have any, any is it any different from getting jobs for that matter? Um I mean I think internship is again an opportunity for you to impress the employer so if you are a very good intern then they might just give you an opportunity but uh, what I understand that getting interns is quite difficult in UAE for lawyers and law firms Um yeah it is a bit challenging because again people don't want to train so one of the good things in india or no no i I'm, i'm saying people who when they want an intern they do not find it easy is that correct like because lawyers have a challenge in getting an intern so if today you, you wanted an intern it will be quite challenging compared to india it's very easy to find an intern if you just put out something many people will apply but when you are a lawyer or a law firm of course big law firms don't have the challenge but there are a lot of uh, mid size and smaller size law firms independent lawyers when they are trying to find interns they are finding it very challenging uh i haven't really seen that to be honest because we always have people applying for internships at a law firm so there are also law schools in dubai so people are always looking out for internships so you know i think it's even the supply and demand it's quite even i haven't really seen too much of a challenge of course i mean uh, if you're applying during the school term then you know i mean during your semester then you might not find law law students mm-hmm. uh, but otherwise i haven't really seen too much of an issue with internships right. um will an llm from the uae help i mean a lot of people are asking about llm from the branches in of you know universities in dubai 
I would say that, uh, you know, um, I would still say that, you know, if you have the funds, then you should probably just take an LLM from Europe or UK or US. Right. Uh, because uh, Dubai is good, but, uh, you know, it doesn't really give you too much of an edge if you have a LLM from Dubai. It might help you understand the local laws and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I would still say that, uh, you know, uh, US and UK... Mm -hmm. Valued much more, right? So yeah. it's, it's a very interesting thing. So, you know, as you know, also, Priyasha, that we have been looking to launch course, law school courses in UAE and uh, very soon. So what's happening is that when we started researching, it seemed that uh, people value Indian lawyers quite well, and Indian education especially. In UAE, they regard it quite highly. And not only in the UAE, in the entire Middle East, people have very high opinion of uh, Indian education. So if you have if you have Indian education, people assume good things about you. I'm not sure about specifically about law. This is a general feedback. And uh, at the same time, like, you know, perhaps, uh, but if you if you have Western education, definitely it is like highly valued. Like people assume, like mm -hmm. rather than having Dubai specific education, people who have money in Dubai definitely go out and get their education. Is what yeah. I understand. Yeah, and again, like I said, if you if you do have some UAE law knowledge, let's say somebody takes a law seco course and gets some UAE law law knowledge, and let's say you write articles about it, or you can show that you've done some research on UAE laws, that might just give you an edge. So, uh, yeah, I mean, do international law firms consider Indian lawyers experience? Again, here, I think contacts help. So I definitely faced issues when I was applying to international law firms because um, they were not that receptive towards Indian lawyers unless you knew them. So let's say I had worked on a couple of deals with, uh, you know, partners who are based in Dubai. So I could at least, I, I could manage to speak to them and at least have a coffee meeting but opportunities, uh, it was a little difficult. I haven't said that later on when I built my UAE experience, it was a lot more easier for me to, you know, uh, to have uh, people approach me. So that time it, it was difficult. But when I didn't have any UAE experience, uh, it was a bit hard. Okay, Bushra is asking, because she's asked this for the second time, what was the selling point? But I think I've already, I, I sort of mentioned that earlier, you know. Bushra is a law school student and she is in Bahrain, in fact. So yeah, I think definitely. Oh, okay. Like I said, it was a lot about networking, meeting people. I, I already had experience in India. So it was more about conveying to the employer that these skills can be used in the UAE. I can draft contracts. I can actually, uh, you know, I can actually be of value. You don't have to train me. Right. Um, let's see. I know there are a lot of lots and lots of questions. Yeah. Uh, what is the scope for a UK law graduate also qualified in India uh, with the UK firms? Um, yeah, I mean, I, again, you, you know, if you have a UK qualification, that might just give you an edge. Sometimes you might not get opportunities in UK firms specifically, but you can definitely get opportunities in regional firms. So that's one area that you can actually tap into because international law firms, they tend to be slightly more difficult to enter into because they also have their hiring happening a lot of times from London rather than the Dubai office. So if you have contacts in the London office of that law firm, you might have some, you know, some better chance. Better chance. Better chance. Okay. So there are a lot of questions. I'm not sure, like, you know, how many we can cover uh, about IPR in, in Middle East. Maybe yeah, this is a question that we have got. IPR, again, IPR is pretty much similar. I, there are a lot of Indian lawyers practicing IPR here. So IPR also tends to be on the simpler side, I would say. Uh, so uh, there definitely is scope for IPR. In fact, I've, I know a couple of other lawyers. Uh, you can also work as an IP consultant, so not exactly as a lawyer. So I do know a lot of Indian lawyers who've gotten opportunities in the IP field. I believe there's a lot of registration work and not so much of litigation related to IP. Oh yeah, a lot of registration. There is litigation as well, but not too much. A lot of registration work. How do you see the UE legal market post COVID? Yeah, actually right now, uh, Definitely, the economy is going to face a setback. There are a lot of issues, and this is world over. So I think the UAE will be no different. Um, but I, with, uh, with Dubai being an arbitration hub, there may be a lot of work around that. 
Yeah, I think, you know, when the closure, when everything settles now, definitely lawyers will always have a big role. There'll be bankruptcies, there'll be a lot of litigation. Um, I think... Contracts lawyers, re, uh, re, uh, being renegotiated, mediation, restructuring. Yeah, there'll be a lot of banking work, yeah. like, you know, people negotiating with banks. So I would say definitely the legal market will pick up. It's just that right now, people are not doing business, so... There is a bit of a lull. Yeah, yeah, but that's just a very, uh, you know, it's a matter of a few months. Great time to do business development. Yeah, okay. yeah. How is it preferable to work in US based MNCs or law firms if I want to shift to US in a few years? Um, I, I mean, I think that would depend on the US market. So I would say uh, maybe work for a US law, yeah, MNC, or maybe work for a US law firm and get US qualified. So mm -hmm. that would help you when you move to the US. Uh, question on competition law in the UAE. It's actually not really that huge in the UAE competition law because it's, it's a very new law and I don't really think even the authorities are enforcing anything. So I would say it's not a great jurisdiction for competition law. There definitely is, is something happening there, but not it's not that detailed. India yeah. would be a better jurisdiction, actually. There's an in interesting question on collaboration opportunities between Indian lawyers and UAE consultants. I mean, can Indian lawyers consult and there's, uh, can Indian lawyers collaborate with UAE lawyers? And the other question is, is there any scope for outsourcing work to India? Um, yeah, I mean, like we just discussed, there's a lot of work happening between Dubai and UAE. So, you know, if uh, sometimes you would have the UAE investors looking to invest in an Indian company, so they would need some Indian lawyers um, and vice versa. Sometimes if you're an Indian investor looking to move to the UAE, you would need to, you know, you would need the help of a Dubai lawyer. So there is, there is definitely a lot of scope for collaboration. Okay, so what are the major areas? I think I see a lot of question about specific sectors, so we cannot possibly answer each one by one by one. Discussing you, in any way, you're out of time in a big way. So yeah, I would, uh, I would, you can just tell what are the areas of law that are very interesting areas for Indian lawyers to practice. Um, well, I would just say that, you know, you, I mean, most of the areas are sort of open to you. Oh, so okay. carbon commercial is open, banking is open. Litigation slightly more challenging, but it's not. It's not the. You can still. You can still practice. If it is okay. niche and commercial litigation, then it's very much open. I think. Yeah, it's yeah, I think there's energy infrastructure laws as well. There are. Pro I know a lot of projects lawyers from India. How about real estate? Real estate is also quite big here. So if you are again, you need. Uh, you probably would need to have a little bit more UA experience. But there's a lot of construction arbitration that happens. Um, yeah. A lot of real estate work too. So. And I believe there's also a lot of labor and employment work. Uh, yeah, labor and employment yeah. is a very general skill. So, you know, you can pick up, to be honest with you, I sort of picked up a lot of basic labor laws in one day. There was a workshop and I pretty much picked it up. So yeah. uh, labor is, is something that you can easily pick up. But, you know, something that's easy becomes even more challenging to get an opportunity. So you have to, if you're a labor lawyer, you have to show that you have other skills as well. Sorry, yeah. I'm just I'm just sharing a link to uh, you know this is basically a website which sort of tells you the cost of living cost in different living. countries. Mm -hmm. So this will help you sort of analyze what would be a suitable salary for you. So I would say the way you decide your good your salary is that you need to get paid a lot more, at least three to four times, or maybe two or three times more than what you're getting paid in India. We so, have the same quality of lifestyle. Yeah, exactly. So try to understand what is make it you know, uh, try to understand from this website what could be the cost of living, speak to people, and then that's when you can understand what would your, what could a, su a suitable salary be? Because a lot of people are asking questions about salary. So right. that's what I did for myself. I was like, okay, I, I don't want to, because there are, in every country you have a, a, a wide range in terms of what you can get. You know, you can work for a top tier law firm in India and get lakhs. Or you can work and do for. You need to, do you need to negotiate a lot when you go for these uh, these jobs, like for interviews and? Um, so I would say, you know, don't look at any of these. Some of these recruiters, they come out with all these, you know, salary ranges and all. They're really on the higher side, and a lot of them applies to only 
you know very very like uk uk lawyers or english lawyers so uh, i would say do some research try to understand what you can survive with and what you what makes you happy and that's how, that's how you should approach the market um mm mm-hmm. Of course sometimes you you might have to adjust your expectations a little bit and that's what I also had to do but it was something that was comfortable for me so how okay. much how okay you're asking how much it will cost to set up and what will be tax maybe you can talk about tax just a bit yeah i mean well tax if you are you know if you are moving to the ue as an employee there's no tax so if you're setting up as well as a law firm there is no tax as such but you know there'll be a vat which is applicable when you're doing a transaction so okay um okay i think we have covered a lot of questions uh, there are some questions that are coming we've already answered like is it necessary to learn arabic we've already answered these questions yeah tax law practice yes there is good good opportunity yeah, for tax yeah tax because they just uh, if you're in direct tax then definitely i think there's a lot that you can do here so that was introduced the in 2018 so if you have tax experience then definitely there are opportunities here for indirect and, and, tax and a lot of international tax and transfer pricing kind of work also in the new Yeah yeah I do know a lot of tax uh, you know entities here they do hire indian lawyers as well also a lot of these audit firms and stuff they they're looking for indian tax lawyers right um go for in house lawyers contract drafting yes contract drafting lots of contract drafting chance yeah lots of uh, contract drafting is what worked for me so yeah. i had that experience Mm. Again, the same question. Do you have some opportunity to get a lawyer in Dubai? We should discuss that. Dubai's ADR practice. Yes, there's a lot of arbitration happening here. So arbitration is 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 a, is a area you can tap into. Are there in-house real estate opportunities? Yes, I do know people who've gotten to re- who are working in-house in real estate companies. So. Globally speaking, right now real estate is not in a very good place, so you probably don't want to go and join real estate companies in India or anywhere else because uh, as people who are outside doing real estate work are still doing better, but in-house real estate lawyers aren't doing so good because in companies are under a lot of pressure from like you know lack of investment, lack of sales in real estate, people are struggling. So if you are a in-house counsel, not the greatest time in the in in history to be a in house real estate lawyer but if you are outside real estate lawyer still you are doing litigation and a lot of stuff so maybe you doing better okay so i think we have had a lot of questions uh, somebody wants to prepare from first year in law school to when to be prepared for opportunities yeah, in I, dubai I would, actually one point that i would definitely say here is that ue is not a good place for young lawyers for people who are just graduated from law schools because there's no training culture here in the ue people want experienced lawyers they don't want to train somebody because people keep coming and going so for the employer the question is why should they invest in somebody who is going to leave the firm anyways so i would i always say that you know it's always good to start out in some other country so maybe start out in your home country try to get an opportunity maybe uk or singapore if you're studying there or if you're in india then i would say work for an indian law firm then when you have that experience then you can move to another country because by then you would you know you wouldn't really need to be trained again so much right there is a lot of this subham has been asking this question many times about application procedure what is intake cycle see we have discussed this before we may, may have missed the part of the webinar so you watch the we will like upload the recording on youtube then you definitely watch it you will get your answer there is no specific application procedure you have to apply to different farms you have to try it out and figure out where you can work okay uh i'm trying to up drafting courses yeah i mean it, it it's it's not necessary but of course if you're good at contract drafting and you can show that you've done courses then you know that would definitely help you most preferred field of practice for lady lawyers from india there's there's no difference really you could you know any practice area is open to both male and females um one 
private question is, uh, please name some companies website where Indian lawyers can apply for UAE jobs. Uh, I would say, like I said earlier in my presentation, networking is what helps you get jobs. Uh, for me, job boards, they Just sending app applications may not help you. Yeah, yeah. Just sending applications is very unlikely to work. You need to build your credibility in the UAE market. You have to get people, network. Is there any scope or proposal and pipeline of Dubai, India, Delhi, Mumbai trade corridor? Nothing as such that I know of. But like I said in the presentation, Dubai, India, there's a lot of business happening. So, uh, so you know, uh, there is scope for legal work as well. Right. Okay, great. I think I think that was about it. Okay, uh, I mean, I think one last question is COVID, better or worse impact. Uh, I mean, I th we've already answered this question. I think it should be uh, right now, it's not going to be good for anybody to come to the UAE because no hiring is happening. But once all the barriers are lifted, then I think uh, things should improve. Things should improve and it should be good. I mean, there's no need yeah. to think, have a pessimistic view of the market for lawyers. I think. So uh, kindly indicate some three, four major areas where in advisory consulting work in Dubai. It's a little difficult because you have to be in the market to get clients. But I would say maybe you can, maybe tax is something that maybe can be done from, you know, maybe, I don't know. But if you, if you want to do some business in consulting in Dubai, generally you have to be present here. And yeah. Okay. There are some people who raised hands. We have answered many of those questions already. Anybody still want to speak on online and ask questions? I just I would just say that uh, follow me on LinkedIn. Yeah, share that. I I just put my name and then you can. Oh, one sec. And then I would also put another link. This is for networking. Yeah, hi, Priyasha. Thank you for such a wonderful webinar. Oh, yeah. uh, I, so I'm a commercial and a corporate lawyer, uh, similar practice, but based in India. I just wanted to know, can we take up some, uh, apart from taxation, as you mentioned, some contract, contract drafting work or other consulting work for Dubai from uh, Delhi itself? Would that be possible? Um, I think that might be slightly challenging because you might face some difficulties with the, you know, uh, tweaking your contract to UAE laws. So you might definitely face certain, I would say certain challenges there. Um, unless you had somebody in the UAE who could review your contract. So maybe you can draft the contract and then send it to a UAE lawyer just to make sure that you know, it, it complies with UAE laws. I haven't really seen too much of it, to be honest, uh, you know, Sorry. people doing work from India, but there is scope for that. But um, you would need to have somebody in the UAE to review your contract and to, you know, make sure that it's complying with UAE laws. And any work for the companies, which are the branch offices, which are based in India and the head office is in Dubai. Can we do that legal work for the Indian branch offices or the subsidiaries? Yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. Uh, if, if there's a UAE company which has a branch office in India, then uh, you know definitely they would need an Indian lawyer. So there, there's an opportunity there. I'm just trying to think. I can't think of any right. other. Right. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of UAE lawyers as well here who, um, who I don't know if they're part of this. Uh, you know, part of this. What do you say? Uh, webinar as well. But even they would be able to have some insights. Right. Thank you. There is a group called Dubai Legal Professionals actually in LinkedIn. Okay. I don't know whether you can join this group as an Indian lawyer, but uh, if you're exploring the UAE market, you might be able to network with people from this group. So this is where you can just maybe, you know, you can see the members, you can connect with them, get mm -hmm. some advice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, so like networking is a long term process, you know, so once you start your networking, you will reap the benefits after many months. So has the extension of the jurisdiction to India increased the scope for lawyers? Um, yeah, I think so. Indian lawyers, yeah, actually, yeah. And this is a good point because, uh, you know, now UAE judgments are enforceable in India. So you will have a lot of people trying to 
uh, enforce uh, UAE judgments in India. So that's where a lot of litigation lawyers, you have an opportunity. So if you reach out to, you know, law firms in the UAE, you might actually get some work in terms of, uh, you know, people trying to enforce debts, because a lot of debtors fly back to their home countries. So that's one area where you can definitely get some work. And again, that follow on me right? So Naiju wanted to ask some questions. Naiju, go ahead. Hey, hey, thanks, Ramanjan. Hi, Prinka. So I just wanted a uh, clarity on how is the uh, multiple questions. One is how is the compliance market in UAE? Second is what is the sector which can be focused in UAE? Let's say I understand uh, it is majorly into oil and gas, right? So let's say if I had worked with oil and gas industry in India, is that going to help? Third is uh, are there any other sectors where you can focus, which is uh, primarily driven in UAE? Um, yeah, I mean, like, as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, you know, oil and gas is, of course, uh, big, but now the importance is slowly reducing. But if you have oil and gas experience in India, definitely that would help you because I do know of a lot of oil and gas opportunities here where they're looking for Indian lawyers. Um, also, uh, the other sectors are trading, real estate, uh, education, um, projects as well i would say so is the business model same or is it completely different i see law application of law comes second but how is the business model like is that the same what you find in india or is it uh, 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 different um let's say talk about the new companies like fintech so fintech model in india is it same is it that universal across or is it slightly modified well, there would be slight differences because, uh, you know, uh, the legal system is slightly different. But in terms of, uh, I would say technology, it's the same, right? So you mm -hmm. would still have your contracts, let's say software development contracts, you would still have your regulatory issues to deal with. So I would still say that it's more or less the same. You just have to know how the laws in the UAE are different. All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. Great. I think uh, we are at the towards the end of our session. So, uh, what would be your final, uh, you know, you know, uh, ideas that you want to leave our audience with? Um, I would just say that you know, if you are very intent on moving, uh, then uh, I would say that you know, be persistent. Um, otherwise, you know, uh, well, do your research as well before you are moving countries, so that you know what you are getting into. Um, also, uh, you know, when you're looking for an opportunity, you have to be very persistent. And, and so if you're in the market, you're looking for an opportunity, don't give up hope, just, uh, just keep trying and, and also learn from your mistakes. Like I told you as well, right? When I was looking for an opportunity, I made mistakes, I, certain things were not working. So try to reach out to people and understand uh, what you can do differently to get an opportunity. And people will be helpful, especially, you know, if you're an Indian lawyer, reach out to other Indian lawyers, they will definitely give you some tips. Um, sometimes it's not easy, like I said, to, to get responses from people. So I would say I shared one article on networking. So uh, you know, try to change your approach when you're, you know, like approaching people, you know, just make, because you want to make sure that they respond to you. So don't just send a message saying that, hey, help me get a job. Send a message which is a bit more, um, you know, uh, which is break the ice before approaching somebody. Again, the same approach as dating, right? So I think there's a question about from Ishmeet Kaur. She's saying that she has been looking for an opportunity for a, for an year already and four years of experience kind of vacancies are posted are quite filtered and uh, such as having specific universities or nationalities. Could you help to find out in appropriate sites? So now, see, it's not about a site. I mean, in, even before Priyasha says anything, I want to tell you something. Yeah. There's the same exact question that people face in India. They say that, People are writing that only NLU graduates should apply. Only people who have worked in big law firms should apply. And how? What can we do? The thing is that you know, if uh, only about like 70, 80 percent jobs are never advertised, they are filled through our own networks, right? Even in our, our organization, there are 50, like you know, 50 people working. And if we have to hire somebody, uh, taking interviews is like the last resort to put it out. Some, even sometimes we put it out and so many applications come, we can't process. So you always try to see, okay, is there somebody we already know amongst our students or our friends or 
somebody we know we in fact ask that do you know anybody that who can who will fit into this position and then we hire right so and that is the same thing everywhere in the world because people want referrals people see who is already in their network so if you do the, the last 10 20% jobs that come in the market as advertisements those are anyway not the best job sometimes sometimes they are like there's going to be too much competition for them 100% so you need to target the other 80% by networking with people by building relationships so that you are not dependent on this this 10 20% Priyasha, what would you say? Anything to add? Yeah, I, mean, I would. I wouldn't really add to that. I would say the same thing. Um, you have to network, and there are opportunities. You just have to work extra hard to find them, and this. And how you get these opportunities is through networking. Great. So I think we are gonna we are gonna end this here. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, do share your feedback in our WhatsApp groups. as well as uh, with me personally i leave my phone number if you need to re- uh, get in touch and share your feedback or request anything any new sessions or or you know you have any speaker suggestions feel free to reach out and let me know we would love to do more sessions and uh, take care everybody thank you so much priya sir for making time yeah, thank you for your participation everybody and and i hope i can help maybe through linkedin Uh, but yes, uh, I mean, uh, I would say connect with me, and and then I can help, you know maybe introduce you to other groups or something like that. Great, great, and hope to have you back again to share more insights soon. Okay, thank you so much, everybody, and yeah, stay safe and 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 be healthy. Yep, thank you. Bye. Bye.